Hey everybody, Jay Shlansky here from the Fifth Trooper Network. I just want to take a moment to thank you for checking out this show. Did you know that over at thefifthtrooper.com we have tons of other content, including blogs, other podcasts, all kinds of stuff. In addition, if you want access to exclusive content, you can join us on patreon.com slash thefifthtrooper and join at any level and you'll get access to uh, exclusive blog articles, access to our private Discord, and much more. So please, Check us out, and thank you so much for all your support. Welcome to the Fifth Trooper Podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the Fifth Trooper Podcast. I'm Jay Shalansky, that's Tim Hannon. This is a podcast about Legion. Look at that. Legion and other life things. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, Disney, Lorcana, sometimes yeah. Legion, sometimes nonsense. You never do know. Lorcana's got some uh, some new stuff coming out soon. That's exciting. Yeah, I. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, I was real hot on it there for a while, and then I just got really busy, and I just haven't. I mean, I've been ancillarily paying attention, but not like I focused up I've, on it. I've been so busy with Legion weekends, I haven't had time to yeah. have a non-Legion weekend, so I can't this weekend. But I'm hoping next weekend to get back into like the local scene and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. We we have a couple good local scenes going on for it actually, so it's it's really healthy right now. It's just I haven't had the time, but it's still it's still a lot of fun. I bring my deck with me everywhere I go now because you never know who's going to throw down. I think we both brought it this past weekend, and we never even we never got around to it. I know, I know, we did. So funny because it's like um, it's weird, right? Because some events, like Rachel was not making fun of me, but kind of laughing because I had packed like. I packed like three games. I packed my Legion stuff. I packed like Lorcana. Yep. Like I packed all this stuff. And I was like, yeah. She goes, why are you packing all that? I go, I don't know. Maybe somebody wants to play a game or wants to get a game yeah, of Legion yeah. in after the tournament. I go, I don't know. Yeah. I just want to be, you know, prepared. And then li- literally none of that happens. So she she was just laughing because I always tell her she's overpacking, uh, yeah. you know, for stuff. And and uh, yeah, so. Uh, well, uh, she, yeah, but when you go... When you go to a convention full of a bunch of fellow nerds, but not only that, but like a bunch of friends, right? Yeah. Like you never know what you're going to want to throw down. That's true. That so, is yeah. true. Better to bring it. But yeah, so uh, Tim and I were at the uh, Golden Sprue tournament this past weekend. I was streaming. Tim was playing. That uh, went well. Great tournament. Uh, good yeah. time had by all. A lot of good people there. So it was a blast. Yeah, that was great. Um for those of you uh, who haven't had a chance yet, we um, we've got the play test group for our skirmish mode up and going on our uh, Patreon Discord. So if you still want to be part of that and and play test, uh, we're gonna be probably play testing for the next month or so. Uh, this first iteration, anyways. Uh, so a lot of good people on there, and and we're. We're, we're getting good feedback and hopefully going to incorporate some of that and make a really good version of, of skirmish here pretty soon. Um, so yeah, so I'm super excited about that. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Yeah. Today, you know, I, I anticipate maybe a little bit shorter of an episode. Um, you know, Tim and I are kind of tired still. And I, I feel like we say that every episode and then it just never and inevitably we go down some rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One That's of us it. gets going on something. But uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, let's let's uh, let's hop over to mailbag. Uh, so if you've been hiding under a rock and this is your first episode, uh, we have a Patreon and on our Patreon discord, we have a couple channels, one for questions or comments that you want us to read on air and the other one is uh for lists that you build that you want us to tear apart uh or talk about at least uh i don't know if everybody wants us to talk tear about. them apart but they definitely I was say, want yeah, us some to... people... <laughs> yeah some people just want us to look at lists and i don't think they want to <laughs> want us to tear it apart just they just want to uh, have yeah. some feedback maybe some, yeah. some positive feedback crazy how that might yeah. sound uh yeah so all right first one here is uh from pinto 397 great work love the fire support discussion thanks buddy yeah thanks Uh, i believe that's dan uh all right next question how do you develop your plan a (laughs) 
<laughs> I didn't realize that was it. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and that's thought, it. Yeah. I, I thought that was the first thing and then like leading into another question. Like, oh, nope, 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 nope. Nope. That was the whole thing. Uh, all right. So next one is coming from Kablooey Kablam. Uh, he's got one of the, fro I think that's one of the frogs from Naruto on there. Uh, how do you develop your plan A to win once you know the board edge and battle cards? There are a ton of variables like your list, opponents list, etc. But I'd love to hear a broad strokes discussion about how evaluating those variables and deciding how to deploy which enemy units to focus and how you win the objectives. Sure. Okay. So those are all all great questions. And this is uh and honestly if you go back to I want to say it's day 2 of Golden Sprue, you can watch the video on demand on our YouTube. You can see Evan uh Bullris, the raccoon uh with his Geonosians playing against a Tempest list in the in round it would have been round 4, but it's the Ooh. first round of day 2. That'd be uh, a fun matchup. And, yeah. And this is a classic, classic thing uh, that he did, which is they were playing intercept, uh, which, you know, this and this is kind of my my take on this is once I know what the battlefield is, once I know what the 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 objective and everything is, I go, OK, who can score on this objective? Right. Yes. And yeah. so. In this case, and then this example of Evan's game, uh, Cam was his opponent, and uh, he had Tempest, so he had ATSTs. He had a bunch of scouts. He had one uh, one stormtrooper with with an R four, and he had an Imperial. So, in that, for instance, you kill all the things that can score, right? And so, you know, I think. Evan tried to get a couple early shots in on one of the ATSTs just because he knew it was going to be a problem if he didn't. Um, sure. And once he figured out that he wasn't going to be able to do as much damage as he thought he was going to be able to do, he just started focusing up on uh, on the objectives and killing off anything that could score, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the one thing to always keep in your mind, uh, and this was in this game too, Evan at one point looked like he was moving – he had one, like two or three man Genosian squad on his back intercept behind a building. Nobody was touching that, right? Uh, and at one point, it looked like he was moving what he had left of his army. He had a couple B twos and some Genosians and Sunfac, and and uh, and they were all kind of moving towards the middle intercept. And what he did was he moved one of his B twos to his opponent's intercept. And like okay. his opponent clearly didn't see it coming. So sure. his, his opponent only had the Imperial officer back there. Mm. And so Evan basically did a double move round five, I believe it was made it look like he was going to score the middle objective objective and then yeah. did another double move and just got right next to his back intercept. And at that point, uh, he was too engaged and had to go to the middle objective in order to score. Right. And at that point, yeah. Evan just had more thumbs than he did to get to that middle mm -hmm. objective. And so I think, you know, long way around uh, to what I'm saying is that you want to take a look at what can score. So if it's stuff that if it's only trooper units that can score and you see some, non-trooper units on the board generally my recommendation is to ignore those they're going to shoot you they're going to be able to hit you you know don't ignore yeah. them in a way like put yourself out in the middle uh, in the open where somebody where they yeah. can destroy you but don't waste right. firepower on them you know like and in in evan's case even though we tried the atst thing you know i think the only thing that i would like comment on is something i would have done differently is just ignored the atsts and just tried to yeah. kill all his thumbs and then just went yeah. okay well now you can't score so what are you gonna do yeah well and that's the thing too is i think what a lot of people play and of course it depends on the objective but i think a lot of people when playing certain objectives and i really think of kp when i'm thinking about this but also to some extent sabotage yeah. Um, is people will just assume that their home home point, home evaporators, you know, what have you, but we'll just call it a home point for the sake of argument, that their home point is always safe. 
Yeah. And it's just not necessarily true. So that's another thing that I think when you look at that, it's not something you can establish at the beginning of the game. Right. But uh, I guess actually sometimes you can. If you see that your opponent's only putting like one kind of grabber squad, like a naked squad in the back, then start thinking about how can I put pressure on that back point? And maybe you can't and that's okay. But there's plenty of times when you can and then you can kind of almost kind of like you were talking about with Evan, like feign in a direction and then all of a sudden go over in a different direction completely and, and kind of take them by surprise. Like I did that, uh, not last, not this LVO that just happened this month, but uh, last year at LVO, I ran double save realist, which was actually a lot of fun. It did pretty well. Um, but I made it, it look like I was going towards to the fight in the middle point. Yep. And then like fighting the middle point, you know, getting my saber closer and closer and then my last activation of the final round, I double strafed over to his his KP and just landed on his KP and displaced his guys in such a way that they couldn't come back to touch it. Yep. And that was game. <laughs> and that was game. I was like, that was my plan the whole time. <laughs> so I, I never actually wanted the middle point. I just wanted to make it look like I wanted the middle point. Um so yeah, so always be paying attention to where the weak points are too. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing too, it's like understanding. So another great example from the stream, the first game we had, which basically sealed the entire game was uh, Rich O'Brien uh, versus Nick. Um, I forgot Nick's last name off the top of my head, but Rich uh, basically was playing Yoda. He was playing Yoda Barks and he had an arc unit. They were playing Recover the Supplies. Arc Scout 2. Yep. So basically what he did was he uh he's he scouted he scouted up. Yep. Then he moved and grabbed the objective, the middle objective, then yep. went with Anakin. Or no. I'm sorry, Yoda. With went Yoda. With Yoda and guidanced yep. and had yep. them and then had them come back. And so yep. basically uh they he had the middle objective and was gone uh yeah. before nick could do anything about it yeah and yeah. I think, and then at, then at that point for clones then you can just castle up and just not die ever that's exactly again. right yeah he basically <laughs> got the other two boxes turtled up behind a building and then just waited it just was like okay i guess you gotta come to me now and then just yeah, yeah. um yeah, so so I mean that's that's something uh to look out for. I think looking at your army beforehand and going, okay, you know, if recover pops up, I can do this move. If this pops up, you know, but then also uh just kind of being a student of the game and understanding like, hey, if I see recover the supplies and I see Yoda arcs, uh there's a full arc squad there's a solid chance that they're gonna just go grab that box and run off and i need to be prepared for that also not for nothing kind of touching a little bit on what we talked about last week and last week's list review but yoda wookies don't hate that game plan too because if you put recon yeah. intel on the wookies especially if you get ap i mean don't give that to someone who's if that's who you're playing against but if it happens and that's what you're playing, be aware that that's what's going to like, there's going to be a squad of Wookiees. So the whole job is just to grab a box and run. And yep. again, with scout normally with recon Intel and any other scouts going on, they can get up there pretty easily. Yeah. And so, yeah. So I think your plan a to win. Here's what I find too. Whatever your plan is. Stick to it. Because I think a lot of people, uh, yes get scared or get nervous and they they'll change their plan like mm -hmm. it, 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 because something didn't go their way or like the first turn or two didn't go their way and then all of a sudden they're shifting their plan and i yeah. find that that 80 percent of the time is what really cost you where if you had just stuck with your plan uh you know, because you planned it, you've been thinking about it, you know, you know, you know, you practiced it most likely, like you've been yeah. doing this for a while. And so it probably still would have worked, even though you were suffering some losses or some hiccups. But I mean, I, most of the time I see people fail was when they end up changing their plan because their opponent does something unexpected. Um, sure. When you could just just the, the plan should just stay the same and you just, you know. Yeah, and especially for target priority, I think. I think there's yeah. a lot of times, and I, I I absolutely get this as someone who 
plays Empire, plays clones with the fire sports. I understand that there's certain shots you want to take against like a full health squad versus like a one man squad, like, mm -hmm. you know, a unit leader left or two guys left. And I get that. I get the appeal of that. But first off, two things. <laughs> a, if you're playing as clones, you don't have to fire support every shot. Just understand right. that you don't, no one's forcing you to do that. So you don't have to, if you feel like it's a waste of a fire support, then don't fire support. You're allowed nope. to not do that. <laughs> so secondly, it's okay to wipe out an activation because so much of this game is about the single unit leader, right? Like how many times have you seen a game, especially the close games and the really good ones come down to the wire where it's KP or intercept, oh, yeah. what have you. And there's one lone unit leader left. And then you're kicking yourself because you didn't, you didn't finish them off when you had the chance. And now you're also down to one unit leader because dice happen, goes back and forth. Now you don't have the firepower to kill him. Now you're rolling, you know, one or two dice, hoping to God that you can yeah. get him knocked off before the end of the game when you could have just finished him off the whole time. So I think it's sticking to your game plan and also sticking to your target priority Yeah, and finish what you started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right, you know, because I've seen people like start shooting what let's say a like a clone squad right and they're just not getting any hits through and then they're like all right i'm going to shoot this saber tank now and you're like no you should have kept shooting those clones like yeah. you know but you get frustrated and i get it it's just just yeah. stick stick to what you your original idea was you know um you know i think from a deployment standpoint uh because he asked about that like how do you deploy it like, that's all subjective to yeah. you know your your opponent's list to what the objectives are but you know try i think a lot of people uh unless you see an opening that can absolutely get you turn the tide of the game in your favor in round one most yeah. of the time uh, and this is something i learned from kyle from scoundrels is like being patient and like round one just kind of like waiting like yeah. just sit back get behind cover or line of sight blocking, you know, dodge standby and just kind of wait and see what your opponent does. And yeah. then, and then start making some more informed decisions uh, mm -hmm. from there. So, you know, cause a lot of people, I think rush, I've noticed a lot of people like rush out on turn one and are like, what? here we go. You know, <laughs> oh my gosh, I rushed into your gun line. I can't believe this has happened to me. Yeah. Now you're shooting me. How did this happen? And most of the time, I think turn one, you could be very patient and just sit back and just kind of see what's going on. And, uh, you know, unless, unless your opponent's being hyper aggressive towards an objective, patience, I encourage patience. And also I do think, Obviously, every objective is is a little different, but I think the big one to me that stands out as far as game plan goes, and again, going back to the question, I think the big one where you have to plan specially for is recover the supplies normally because you have to grab it and go. Yep. But probably almost a tie between recover the supplies, but I think especially payload. Uh, you have to be aware of two things now with the, the rules change. A, you have to be aware of what can the payload go over and can't. Hopefully, you already talked about that with your opponent. If you know, yeah, please talk about that. But make sure you're always aware of that. And then B, you have to be aware that at some point, most likely in most payload games, probably like eight or nine out of ten, you're going to end up fighting in the middle. And so you need to prepare because that payload cart's going to move. And so you can't castle completely. And so you need to think multiple turns ahead in a game of payload to say, not so much where is my payload right now, but where is it going to be really on turn three? Turn one and two are pretty pretty straightforward. But once you hit turn three and above, that's when it gets really interesting because now you have their carts in the middle, your carts in the middle, and now you're going to be really, you're going to be close enough to where you could be like, counting for both cards or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one force push stops someone from scoring their cart, blah, blah, blah. A million different ways to cut it. But it's it's a very unique situation that I think is very unique to payload where yeah. it's, you're guaranteed almost, unless you're just completely skirting each other to end up clashing over this thing. So there was a really, uh, I think it was game two on stream, game two or three, uh, two. The... Um, both the the blue pair picked a piece of terrain for the opponent's payload, which was so they were playing major offensive. 
and he picked a piece of terrain that was just kind of on the edge of his deployment yeah. uh, up to the right. Yeah. The opposing player was playing clones and then picked the same piece of terrain. It was oh, wait. wild. I got to think about that. Hold on. Oh, he picked the same piece of terrain. So, so the payload moved backwards? So so both the payloads were, you know, the little panhandle and major? Yeah, yeah. They were both right there at the corner of each. Oh, major. I see what you're saying. And I so, see what you're saying. So for yeah, those yeah. of you watching on, on stream, so if they're both like this, blue player placed the token up here that the right. red player was going to have to go to. The yes. red player then placed the to his token on the same exact piece of terrain. So so the blue player was playing Shadow Collective, Double Bus Shadow Collective, and uh the red player was playing clones and my a lot of people were asking why i thought the red player did that and and my thought on it was i think he did it to clone ball over so because of yeah. what shadow collective had basically he could just hold all his clones around his payload and now the other payloads go into the same place and they're going to be very close to each other. So yep. now he has an opportunity where he's not splitting his force because clones don't do well when they split up. And so, right. so it was, it was really interesting move, but uh, the shadow collective player, Nathan, he ended up just like basically hauling his buses straight at the clones and like <laughs> putting them and they had uh black suns on them and just putting them around oh. his uh his cart and then just yeah. getting his black sun. and it just held the cart there for long yeah. enough that he because the know, buses the, count for him too yeah like so he lost the buses and i think one shadow collective but it didn't matter at that point because he had already delayed the clone player yeah. enough that right. his, you know, he ended up g getting in base touching the terrain. And I think the clone player was range one. So, so, mm. you know, but he, it was just enough delay that it, it stopped uh, that. But anyways, just super that's interesting. That's so close though. That's an interesting game plan for that. I wouldn't yeah. have thought of that, but that's cool. That's cool no one did. About that. Yeah. It was wild. It's, so. I still love, even with the rules change, I still love payload. I know it's not, it's a little bit riskier to take it mm -hmm. but i think it's probably still my favorite objective yeah i you know evan and i when it first came out we did a stream and i got unrationally angry on the stream <laughs> uh because i didn't i played it the way it's played now okay. where before it could just go over everything it just hovered yep. over everything right but i as i read it I read it as it it could only go over a certain height. So like I was yeah. like, okay, I got to go around these buildings and stuff, and <laughs> oh, no. and so I was doing that. And then yeah. halfway through the game, Evans like going start going over a building. I go, what are you doing? And he's like, oh yeah, these just hover over buildings. I go, are you yeah. kidding me? You've been watching me go around buildings this whole time. Like this was not a tournament. This was like a friendly <laughs> stream, and you've been watching me go around buildings yeah. this entire time and not telling me that. Like. Dude, I yeah. lost my mind. I got so angry. Uh, oh, yeah. Ever since then, I've just hated payload. So I just, I refuse oh, to even fair. like mentally deal with it. Um, but, but great question though from, from yeah. Kablooey Kablam. It's, that's really like, it's a really one thing to look at. And I think a really good thing we could leave on this, but I think really good practice to get in the habit of doing, especially like local nights or something like that. You know, if you're just thinking about games, is to get into the habit of what does this list do, whatever list you're building, what does this list do with the worst possible deployment? Like with yeah. the worst possible battle card setup, I should say. Yeah. What do I do? Um, we used to do one on the staff guys called the the red player's dilemma. And like, how do you solve your dilemma? Now I think, and now again, nowadays red player has a lot more power than they used to. So it used to be a little bit different, but you still, still have to figure out how do you solve a imperfect puzzle because inevitably you're going to get something even if it's your battle deck you're going to get some piece of that you don't love because that's right. the way the game is designed is that your opponent at least gets to have a fair shake at, at some point of it so yep. try and figure out what does your list struggle with and then practice your deployments and your game plans for that yeah and then that hopefully can better equip you for anything else moving forward yeah i think so all right thanks uh kablooey kablam 
cool name, by the way. That's probably one of Kablam! my favorite one of my favorite ones we've seen. Uh, all right, next one: force power changes. This is from Cascadian. Uh, if force lift allowed you to move train pieces smaller than a barricade, in addition to barricades, would you use it? And then, are there any other changes to less use force powers you'd like to see? I'll answer your first one. No. Uh, and I don't think it would ever happen because you can't account for that where that you can't like, so, you know, the, you know, the, the size of a barricade, it's a consistent thing, right? The problem is with yeah. anything, anything else, you just, it, it, it's so abstract that it would be hard to like actually like yeah. game develop for that. So, so like, I don't ever see that happening. And I, I don't think that I would like it because like, what if something it may be smaller, but maybe it's in a weird shape and you could now yeah. block me out from moving. Like that doesn't seem, yeah. you know, stuff like that, like would be weird. Well, and so twofold. So I'm a similar answer, but a little bit different for me. A, if I could move things other than the barricade, would I use it? Absolutely. Are you kidding oh, me? There's, yeah. there's so much stuff in this game that goes off of where a piece of terrain is placed. So many victory conditions that go off of that and so many things that can affect that. It'd be so strong. However, it'll never change that. Yeah, so like you, yeah. like that's even the barricade thing we had, they had, didn't they have to fix it in the yeah. forums of, cause it used to be able to block uh, getting to evaporator. You could right. literally stop someone from getting to their VAP and they, I forget how they fixed it, but yeah. they adjusted it somehow. Um, but yeah. It's, yeah. Well, well it would and, be nuts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. It just, it's impossible for a number of reasons. Like, sure. You know, which way does the, which way is up for the train, which, you know, like it just, it, it makes I, sense things hard i'm still impressed that they clarified about vertical barricades like even that is an interesting clarification i understand why but yeah. it's very interesting um, uh and then are there any changes to other less used force powers you'd like to see um that's a good question i have one i have All one right. that i've um this Hit one me. always bothers me because i i always want to bring it especially as a clone player and some clones players do uh, force guidance yeah. The timing on force guidance is so bad because normally for most force users, and of course there's always an exception to every rule, Yoda's always a little bit weird, blah, blah, blah. But most force users, you want to hold them till the end of the round and force guidance wants you to go first Yeah, in order to use that. So I really wish they could fix fix that to say at the start of your, or at the start of your round or whatever, you know, start of the yeah. activation phase gain two search tokens or, you know, uh, give out two search tokens, whatever it is. Uh, I think then it'd be really good. And I don't think it'd be too good because you're putting it on such an expensive chassis that, you know, and you're taking a force slot. So that's one less other really good force power you could bring. So I think it'd be fine. But the timing on it just kills it to me, at least. Yeah, I, um, I think I'd like to see... For me, probably, I don't know what the change would be, but hope and fear. I'd like to see yeah. changes to those. I, one's inspire, one one's demoralize one. I just... I, eh. no, go ahead. I, I don't know. They just don't matter as much anymore, especially now that you don't pan Like, you don't run away when you're panicked like it's just that I, kind of crushed i think that rule change with suppression and how it worked though i like it yeah i'm not i'm not i like the change to suppression um Same. it it changed so many things that they didn't change with it yeah which i think that's the problem with and quite frankly why i i would i would like to see a 2.0 of this game yeah. frankly because because I think there's just so many things like going all the way back to the beginning that were built around a certain rule set. And then when you change just like one piece of the rule set and don't go back and change those cards and what they do, well, they're just useless now. Yeah. And I, so I, I agree with you to an extent. I think, I think hope and fear are both not super useful, especially because again, they take up a force power slot. I do think hope is much better than fear, but 
better than trash isn't always gold. So like it's slightly less trash trash. <laughs> um, so it, like I think Inspire is still really useful, especially because of scoring things. And, you know, if you're talking about end of the game and you want to make sure something's not panicked and scoring a KP or something like that, I think hope can be really useful. I think Demoralize is arguably one of the biggest joke keywords in this game yeah. right now. Um, I think it's just the way it works. It's just especially when you have like most things are demoralized one, maybe the big ones like demoralized two. Oh my goodness. That doesn't mean, and I think a lot of people seem to get this wrong. It's not two suppression to everybody at range two or whatever. It's a total grand total of two suppression yeah. dealt to either one target or two targets, whatever, yeah. but you only hand out two suppression. Yep. That's it. What a horrible thing. <laughs> like what? And again, it's actually rare to get demoralized too. Most things are demoralized one. And it's just like, right. the only thing I ever use it for is to get rid of a standby. Yeah. And, and listen, don't get me wrong. Like taking away an action from somebody is definitely good. It's just, yeah, these just aren't enough to like, it's just not. Right. It, and I think, I think the, you know, you can see that it plays out. It's nobody plays anything with demoralized. Right. Well, and look at the difference between demoralize, any demoralize, take your pick, and Vader's might, or sorry, so, so, uh, duh, 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 sorry, Master of Evil. Sorry. Yeah. Card. Master of Evil. Master of Evil is a phenomenal card. Yep. Because it's dealing three suppression to every enemy at range two. Right. Not, it, Vader does not get demoralized three. Not just two. Right? Yeah. Three <laughs> it's, it's not demoralized three. Right. It's deal three suppression. And it's a great card. Mm hmm. And I think that's it's a very simple difference, but it's a, a huge difference all the yeah. same. But uh, yeah, anyways, so that's uh, that would be kind of what we would want to make changes to. Um, I think other than that, maybe some price changes on stuff, but I, it, not enough. I don't. Yeah, enough I, I think force powers are in a spot where it's less about the price and just more about the slot itself. You know, it's there's so many there's some really good force powers out there, some really interesting ones and interesting combos, but. Mm -hmm. Force push is just so good that you're always going to bring force push, except for maybe maybe palp and then maybe some. I've seen some Yoda builds without it, which I get that. But other than like the the hangout in the back people, you're always going to bring force push, and then you're going to bring whatever else that fits. Yeah, yeah. All right, and our final mailbag question today: uh, Golden Spruce summary and Genotions. This is from Juan in a Million. Eager to hear all about Golden Sprue. I bet a lot of us watched the live stream. I thought the commentary was great. Thanks. Uh, in particular, it was exciting to see the Genotians in play. Curious to hear what Jay, Tim, and anyone else uh, who played with them or played against them thought. So just real quick about the commentary. It's funny. I, uh, it's been so long since I've done a stream and done commentary on games. I not nervous that's not the right word but i was hesitant going in because i was a like little, man a little still, rusty yeah do yeah. i still have this can i still do this and it came back yeah. pretty quickly so i was i was pretty happy about that and then uh rachel was sitting next to me and and was like she was actually doing great she 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 yeah. she made some comments and and questions and talked about things and uh, was very relevant and yeah i thought she did a great job too so uh so that was good but yeah uh, as far as um golden spruce probably it reminds me a lot of the northeast open event that we did it's mm -hmm. a very much a fun event let's have fun let's have a good time you know the yeah. booze is right there the food is right there like uh you know you you can drink inside like you know every yeah. it, it just promotes that fun atmosphere the way evan and hob and uh and those guys run run the legion event is very fun and and the prize support was off the charts uh it was wild how much prize support was there um but yeah golden sprue went well i wish more people had come out but i think it was just a combination of a number of different things yeah uh, being right after lvo i think price point was a little high but the prize support was worth it right yeah. uh you definitely got your money's worth out of it. Um, 
And then January in upstate New York is just not idyllic. So Yeah. Well, and yeah, and I know that there were people that had gone last year that really wanted to go this year and they just it was just random life timing things that had nothing to do with right. anything Legion related or or anything. It was just just happen chance that they just couldn't go. Uh so yeah. I'm well, looking forward to next time. It's a super interesting topic because the guy who runs it, Josh, great guy, great guy, and and puts his heart and soul and his his uh, pocketbook into this thing. But like he was, it, we got in a conversation about the differences between 40k Age of Sigmar and Legion players and yeah. what the expectations and what they're willing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things is a tournament like that for 40 K easily, you could charge a hundred bucks and they would pay yeah. it and like, not even think twice Jeez. about it. Same with age of Sigmar. Right. And I think it's because we have ELO, right. But we, we right. run, we run ELO. It's, it's unofficial, right. but, but I mean, it's as, as official as you can get because, you know, we, we take all the game, our, our software yeah. game uplink, right. We take yeah. all the, and, and now we're getting them from long chinks and stuff too, but we're taking all the games and, you know, we're, we're putting in an ELO ranking. Um, but for 40 K and age of Sigmar, that's all done officially through the ITC. So like that's, mm. so when you play, you're officially being ranked every time. And yeah. so I think that plus the prize support, Plus everything else going on, like um, it's just a much bigger deal to that community. Yeah. So like the dollar amount they're willing to pay. And it, it was just an interesting conversation about like what I thought the max dollar amount of Legion player. I, I mean, it's, you know, they uh, 25, four, 24 people did pay $75 to go. <laughs> but like, right. you know, I think like 50 bucks is probably... 45 to 50 is probably where is a reasonable number, especially if yeah. it's just an event like that, where you're just going to play Legion. There's, there's nothing else going on. They had a store, but right. like, you know, it's not, it's not an event. Um, but even yeah. then, you know, Adepticon tickets aren't, I forgot how much they are, but they're like, they're not that. They're much. not cheap. Well, for the one, for just the, an entry into Adepticon, oh, that's, it's I like, see what you're saying. It's like yeah, 50 yeah. bucks or something like that. Like, it's not, yeah, yeah. you know what saying. I mean? Like, you could go yeah, play yeah. Legion for 50 bucks if you want it. Like, right. You know, you know, yeah. and go to Adepticon. So, so I think right. it's, and, and part of the thing is too, and, and this is something, uh, <laughs> Rachel has made it very clear that unless I do something differently, I'm not allowed to run another Northeast Open. Um, I lost a lot of money on that event. A lot. That's fair. A significant amount of money. I um, believe that. I believe that wholeheartedly. <laughs> I, I mean, for those of you who don't know, Northeast Open, we had it in the middle of a convention, like right in the middle. Uh, we yep. had the biggest space at the convention. We uh, <laughs> we streamed. We, we had, uh, what was it, 50 players? So we had 25 yeah, like tables that. back at the time where that was unheard of to try to get, huge if you weren't lvo trying to get 25 tables was yeah damn near impossible so i had to get tables shipped in from like imperial terrain and uh skull forge and uh yeah. legion terrain and like all you know like i was getting tables shipped in i built a bunch of tables you know uh we took everybody who was there out to dinner we we closed down uh, a barbecue joint uh, oh the, the upstairs of a barbecue joint and, and oh, everybody wow. had free dinner. Um, wow. and then those the, were the days. Okay. The, yeah. The first <laughs> night, actually, whoever came and helped set up and was there for the first half, we had an exclusive dinner with, uh, Luke Eddie, one of the oh, developers wow. at the yeah. time. So we, we, and that was all, that was all part, like you didn't pay anything. You just paid your, your regular your entry, entry fee. Or... I don't remember yeah. what it was. I think it was like $45 or something or 40 Jeez. bucks. Um, yeah. But anyways, long, long story long. Uh, I came up with this idea and I'd love to hear you guys opinion on this. Um, and, and Tim, I'd love to hear yours. But my, my idea is what if you did an event almost like a Kickstarter and you go, okay, 
you're very you're very transparent with all your costs. So you go, okay, it's sure. going to cost me this much to rent the space. It's going to cost me this much for tables. This okay. So you have your basic package, and you go right just to have an event of let's say thirty players. It's going to cost us this much. Therefore, your tickets will be X. And right. then what we could do is you could have like either the players could at, have add-ons so that they like, okay, if you guys want to unlock, uh, you know, um, uh, this, like whatever, food. some kind of swag or something or, or like that. Yeah. Or yeah, swag yeah, yeah, or yeah. dinner or, so, or, or, or like coffee. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you can add that on, but then if we get more players, the more players we get, we, we can either unlock more things or we can re or we can reduce the ticket. So like, yeah. You know what I mean? So like, cause the more, the more people you get, you could reduce the ticket without all the add-ons. So then you could kind of have this thing where, you know, you're transparent. You're like, okay, well, if we want to do, if you guys want to have a bar available, right, right. It's, it's, it costs $400 or whatever for the weekend to have somebody come run the bar. You still got paid for your drinks, but you know, somebody has got to come run the bar so that, you know, we need so many players to make that happen. So just putting it in, in Kickstarter terms, because I, yeah. I actually, I like this idea. I do. But I think what you're really talking about is what would be considered stretch goals, not add-ons. Oh, uh, yeah. Stretch goals. Yeah, I said yeah. add-on. Well, no, that. I'm only saying that because add-ons yeah. would be like, yeah. okay, I want, let's just argue. I'm just, just saying like special dice. I want right. special dice, which I actually don't like. Just, I don't like that. Literally. I don't like that because then you're just rewarding people for being rich. Right. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, but stretch goals. Yes. I'm down for that. I, I like that. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, so, so, you know, and you start like in Kickstarter, you start the stretch goals out easy as like, you know, maybe the first stretch goal is, oh, you know, all art cards from Jay, yeah. you know, to every player once we yeah, get, for sure. and instead of a dollar amount, you do a number of players, Yeah, you know, yeah. and then maybe a stretch goal, like when you reach so many players, the stretch goal is that everybody's ticket drops by $5. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'd have to do the math and work that all up, but I think that'd be the only way. Uh, well, me, but I think, I think that's an interesting way to do it because it's like yeah. you're being transparent. Cause I think the problem is most people at home don't understand how much it costs to put, not what I did. I did crazy stuff, but like to just put on a, even just a regular event. A regular event costs money. Like if right. you're putting it in, look at, you know, what I look at is um, what we actually went to not that long ago, the Keystone Classic that, yeah. that Vince put on, which was great. Great time. Great time. But he had to get a hotel room or not hotel room, excuse me, but like a, like a conference room, you know, what have you uh, to have all the tables set up and he had to pay out of like, that takes money. That right. takes time that they, you know. Like, you have to have people agree to bring stuff. Yeah, like, and so here's just some simple math, right, for folks at home, especially around here. I I think most places, but like, let's say in order to run and or to rent a space large enough to run a tournament, okay, let's say of thirty people, so you need to be able to put fifteen tables in this space, okay. You're you're looking at anywhere between fifteen hundred and twenty five hundred dollars, depending on the hotel, okay. So if you had 30 people at $40 a ticket, you're only at $1,200. That won't even pay for the space. Not right. to mention the table, not to mention the terrain, not to mention anything else I need to make that happen. No one's yeah. getting paid. Right. Like, right? Yeah. yeah. Your so, TOs are not paid TOs. Right. So, <laughs> you, you know, realistically, for 30 people you would have to charge, you know, you would start it at like, so if this idea of of a um kickstarter event would happen you would probably go okay at third we have to get 30 people to run this event to start at, at 30 people it's 70 dollars a person that's 2100 dollars. that'll get us the room we'll get the tables there we'll run it at pro bono for free just to you know because it's our event and you would say okay 70 dollars, and then it's like okay well if we get 50 people right it's now 50 dollars for almost right. a similar amount of money right and yeah. so so you're just you know you know what i mean so you could go okay yeah and you wouldn't lower it that much because by the time you would start down the the road of the uh the unlocks 
right? You'd yeah. have other costs incurred at that point because you'd be like, oh, right, okay, right. If, you know, if we get 35 people, well, now the room's paid, so now we can do this giveaway or, you know, oh, right, okay, right. if we have 40 people, well, now we can do, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, but anyway, yeah. so, so it's just like, I think for folks at home, like, I know, I know it's expensive. I know it's hard times right now. I know, I know that we're like basically heading into a recession or whatever we're doing right now. But like, uh, I mean, inflation's up, prices are up everywhere. It's rough times, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. I get it. I get paying that amount to go to an event is real hard. I understand. And I just, I guess the reason I'm bringing this up is to just say like, Hey, it's not, you have to understand all the costs that are incurred and like asking someone to foot that bill is really hard to do because unless you're Adepticon or Gen Con or PAX, you're not doing enough to like justify, you know, uh, uh, renting a room at like a local hotel. Like it's, it's expensive yeah. to do that. Yeah. I think that's true. But I, I like that idea though. I like, I like to stretch goals and things like that. So I think, I think with some retooling, it could be really effective. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I've barely, I had a Eureka moment at Golden Sprue when we were talking about with other people and I've, I really haven't had a chance to put much more thought into it, but I want, you know, I thought this would be cool to bring it up. And if you have ideas, you know, hit me up on, on our discord server or, or comment on here on YouTube. Um, yeah. And let us know if that's something that would, you know, and then what you do yeah. is you go, Hey, if we don't get 30 people, the event doesn't go off, but we don't take your money. Right. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what Kickstarter does. Right. Right. It's, but we need to know by this date so that we could put a deposit yes. down for the hotel. Or you know what Correct. I mean? Like yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, some, yeah. there's some, you have your dates, you have your deadlines. Yeah. There's some situational yeah. stuff you have to deal with, with that. And yeah. I, you'd have to really think it out and plan it out accordingly, you know, but yeah, I mean, I think that would be a really interesting way where you're just kind of like saying, Hey, you, you know, you, you own this event, whether it's going off or not by supporting it and then yeah. getting your friends to go too. I dig that. I dig that. I don't know. It's just super interesting, right? Yeah. But, That's a cool idea. Uh, listen, every day I have a cool idea. It's just whether or not I can, I can get them to lift off, you know? <laughs> I, uh, we picked a list. I just don't know if I got it in me to go through it right now. That's fine. It, it's a neat list, but it's worth it's worth some energy to talk about. I think. Yeah. How, how about this? Let's do this. Let's throw this out here so we can. Okay. Can we? Uh, who who sent it? In? Gator. Yeah, Gator. 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 Hi, we Gator. Talk, we we want to talk about your uh, the fire support we have at home list. We we want to talk about that. But help us understand. We sure do. What Gator. those Ewok slingers are doing in there. Help us understand that. Yeah. Well, and then, hold on. I want Tim to go on a rant real quick. Oh God. About change of plans, please. It's not a rant. It's just facts. Hit change me. of plans. Change of plans is the best command card in this game. All right. A little context. At it's Golden Sprue, after it. round one, I saw Tim at the bar, and he yep. looked real <laughs> sad. And yep. I and Rachel was with me, and I go, uh oh. I go, hey, why don't you head in? I, I got to talk to my boy. <laughs> Something, something's not right. And you just look, just from the back a, of your head and your shoulders, I was like, uh oh. And they I had go, a great espresso martini. It was yeah, fantastic. I go over there. I go, Fine. Tim, are you okay? And you're like, I effing hate change of plans. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> There's change of plans is the most negative play experience I have ever and continue to ever experience in a game. Bar none. It's yeah. not close. And the fact that Han Chewy combo can do it twice. And I, I will tell you this. I definitely forgot that he could do it twice because I just haven't faced that in so long. So like, I have let's, not let's seen ex it done. Explain so, that. So quickly. Yeah. Or so, so long ago. Excuse me. That's so basically, uh, Notorious Scoundrels is as Chewie's three pip. So what I understand is basically turn one, uh, you they play Change of Plans and you were playing darkness descends is that correct yeah which is fine that actually ended up not mattering a whole okay, lot honestly in this game still. but yes and yes, then yes. turn two 
they can then give Chewie and Han orders and uh, with notorious scoundrels. And then you choose one of Han's uh, command cards, command cards and you discard to pile and return it to your hand. And you bring back change of plans. The fact that you can play that card twice, you shouldn't even play it, be able to play it once. No other command card in this game cancels another command card. And there's so many things that cancel well, other abilities and think abilities are fine because abilities are in like once per activation and you have other chances the command cards you get one one around that's it that's it you get one and so the fact that you take that away even if i don't have to discard it I, but still i can't play that this time no it's horrible 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 oh my god it's horrendous. Even the closest thing, the closest thing you can get to it is ISB from Callus. But you can plan around ISB because it says, hey, no two pips next round. And you go, okay, I, now I know I can't play this. So I'm not being, I'm not being jolted. It's saying, okay, I can't play two pips next round. Okay, got it. And then I you can, can play I can say though, with ISB uh, and Callus, there, it's actually, if you do it right, it's actually two rounds. Because sure. what you do is you play ISB and then the next one, like, let's say, for, you know what? I do want to actually talk about this. Tim was playing okay. a very Dracalis list that I completely disagree with its makeup, but. You but, don't completely disagree with it, but okay. It, I do 100%. I agree okay. with Callus Vader and then everything else you did was terrible. But like, so, okay. so, um, cause what you do with Callus Vader basically is you ISB. The next yep. turn you one pip Vader, yep. and then the next turn you one pip uh Callus because he has cunning. So you yep. always have priority. Yeah. For for basically like three for almost ideally, if you do it right, three rounds, you have priority. Fair. Fair. But you're right. But that's none the, of the closest. That's the closest. Right. None of those cancel command cards. Correct. Yeah. And it's just it is such a feels bad to say you can't do that. And that's that's a big thing for me is I don't like people telling me I can't do something. I especially don't like it when I've been planning and I'm I'm strategizing on something and then someone out of nowhere says you can't do that. And I understand right. people are going to say, well, you can kind of tell when it's coming. Sometimes, sometimes you can't. I, I absolutely acknowledge. There's absolutely times when I play against the Han and I say he's probably going to change a plan to me this turn, and yeah. I get that. And I and especially if I play Yoda against the Han because Han is like to me the anti Yoda. Yeah. Because of change of plans, largely, <laughs> I I absolutely try my best to plan around that, and I get that. But I still, at the end of the day, I can't guarantee that they're going to play that card, and so I I can't guarantee when my command card is going to get canceled. Right, and it's a horrible feeling. It is a horrible, horrible feeling. I would never introduce that to a new player. I would, if I played Rebels, which I don't, because I respect myself too much for that. But if I ever played Rebels. I would never play change of plans against a new player because that's just a horrible plan. Yeah. A horrible, horrible play to, to I, feel. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, it's interesting. Right. And then, and then his, uh, you know, and then, and then basically, sorry about the mess is, is cunning basically. Right? Yeah. Like it's it, a zero. It, pip. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah but, yeah. but it's just like, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, disagree i think the thing has been not today in today's world of legion it matters the it, it's the worst now because of you know because of how important command cards are um yeah. but i think the only thing that saves it is that han is not played as often i think if we saw him played more that there would be a a, a change to it I agree, but I've I feel like I'm seeing more. I feel like every rebel list I see has Han, and to be fair, I actually think that's right. I I think they yeah. should. I think yeah, I think yeah. you should because he has so many. Because he has a zero pip. Because right. he has that. Because he has his command cards are what make him fantastic. Although his yeah. peers too against uh, red saves is very frustrating and steady. It was real nice. Yes, and steady. Like I, I, he's absolutely annoying to play against. And then when I see him on the table, I want to kill him. <laughs> but I kill him mostly for command card sake not for right just because he's going to kill my red saves because again like these days there's so much defensive tech that normally you can you can dodge it you can you know with sa you can barrier it whatever like there's there's normally ways around it whatnot but uh yeah 
No, hey, change your plans. But anyway, but to bring us back, yeah, I want to talk about this list some other time. Yeah, but I would like to understand the argument for the single unit of slingers and so. underworld connections. And underworld connections with only one unit of slingers. So, so, so I'll do this real quick. We're not going to discuss yes. it for everybody at home. Gator, if you're listening, I'll message you on Discord too. But yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. Gator's uh, list, it's 799, 11 Axe. It's Han with Underworld, Cassian with his A280, Chewie with Offensive Push, K2 with Jin's Blaster, uh, two Vets with their, with their long-range gun, two Mark IIs with HQ Uplink. That seems yeah. crazy to me. Uh no the oh. rebel commandos with the sniper and ewoks slinger was called the arms and the late uh fd laser cannon with barrage uh, we can talk about it later but yeah we'll talk about it the, the hq uplinks are in the wrong spot but we can talk about that later <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh but yeah i would like to just understand the slingers and the underworld connections and then i'm happy to talk about this some more because it's interesting we will explode it we will kablam kablooey it <laughs> maybe maybe i don't know but I'll uh jump. yeah all right yeah everybody hey thanks for uh uh being understanding of a shorter episode this week we didn't yeah. get to everything we wanted to talk to but we got to enough so that's right that's right and i'm tired good, now. good discussion yeah. <laughs> yeah so all right thanks everybody see you next week Join us next week for another edition of the Fifth Trooper podcast. This has been a Fifth Trooper production.